Welcome, everyone. We're glad to have you here at Vanderbilt University, and a special welcome to our panelists today. Um, I'm going to start with a procedural note. As you may have noticed, um, we've had some interest in audience questions. So I wanted to make clear we will be open to questions towards the end of our discussion, if time permits. And we will also be able to provide mics. And we'd ask you to introduce yourself first if you want to ask a question. So, so hold the thought if it comes to you. And if we have time, we'd love to go there. Uh, as you heard, my name is Vanessa Beasley. And it's my pleasure to be here today. I have been attending the summit, and I've noticed the themes that we've been talking about, particularly with regard to not just uh, modern conflict on the face of it, but also new rules of engagement. And as you heard, today's topic is also one of those new rules of engagement, the extent to which disinformation uh, is a factor in modern conflict and the way threats emerge. Today, I'm really thrilled to be joined by these panelists, Rana, Suzanne, and Dina, to discuss the role of disinformation as a weapon, as an increasingly powerful weapon in these conflicts. Now, we all know Propaganda, disinformation, and deception are not new concepts. We might have new words for them or see them circulating in new ways, uh, but they've always been around. However, today we're seeing them amplified by technological, cultural, geopolitical changes, and even some of the factors that, that are the intersection of those things. And we also know that it moves fast. So speed is a new dimension to the kinds of things we'll be talking about. It impacts every uh, aspect of our society. And we also know that it can be an issue around your holiday dinner table. So just let's be honest about that. There's an interpersonal co component. We also know that it, uh, there's research that suggests that it undermines trust in institutions. And one of those institutions is, of course, the press. So our panel today of highly experienced journalists are going to provide more insights into their experiences and the complexities of disinformation and how it affects uh, our, all of our ability to understand what's going on in the world and especially their ability to bring facts into light. Before we dive deeper, as all the other panels have, I'm going to invite our panelists to introduce themselves with some remarks about their experience and their point of view on this topic. And I'm going to start with Rana. Uh, Rana, I'm aware that you have a book coming out. It's your third book, Homecoming, The Path to Prosperity in a Post-Global World. It's coming out in October, just around the corner. And I know that uh, from that book that, uh, that you're really approaching this topic from this lens of political economy and kind of the big picture context. So let's begin. OK, great. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, great to see um, so many interesting people and some sources of mine, too, in the audience. Um, so I've been a journalist for over 30 years. Um, I've always covered business and economics. I worked in venture capital briefly myself, so I've been sort of on both sides. Um, I've worked in two different continents, uh, Europe and the US. I've also traveled widely in Asia and China in particular. So I have a pretty global perspective. Um, my first book, Makers and Takers, uh, looked at how the financial system was no longer serving businesses and how that has led to a decline in competition. And it's actually uh, was very much linked to my third book, Homecoming, which argues that we are moving into a post-neoliberal world, a world in which conventional globalization is now over. We're going to be in a kind of a one world, two systems paradigm, um, bipolar, if not tripolar. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about my vision for that later. But I think, uh, and I'll just say also, I had a second book, uh, Don't Be Evil, that looked at the power of the major technology platforms uh, and the, the way in which private sector actors, some of the big tech firms, some of the big tech CEOs, are now in some ways on an equal playing field as states. So you have this kind of new world in which uh, companies, countries, communities, individuals are sort of nodes on a network, which I think underscores some of the, the complexity that we're, we're dealing with here. Um, but my lens really um, is sort of a personal one. I, I grew up in the rural Midwest in Indiana. Um, my dad was an immigrant uh, engineer who started a manufacturing business. And so we watched the hollowing out of the US industrial base in the 80s and 90s. That was my childhood, being in factories with him, seeing what was happening, the decisions were being made about outsourcing, um, policy decisions being taken about um, what kinds of jobs, what kind of economy um, the US was going to be. And I think we all know that those had ramifications. Um, and so I would argue, and I have always argued, that um, policymakers and CEOs and many of the people, sadly, that cover these things are being a bit willfully blind to the fact that uh, markets don't know best. Other countries, China in particular, are operating on an entirely different paradigm 
um, uh, and, and with different understandings about the world. Um, and that that's part of the cognitive capture and the misinformation that I've been seeing for years and years just in coverage. I mean, I will give you a couple of examples, just a personal example before, before we move on. Um, I remember my first trip to China. This was right around the time that they'd um, been given uh, membership in the WTO in, in, uh, in 2000. It was 2001 that they entered, but it actually would have been right before. Um, so, so there was an understanding that China was going to be entering the market system, and there was this whole sort of, you know, as they get richer, they'll become more democratic um, line being put forward. And I actually had a conversation at that time with a CEO, um, European CEO in the clean energy space, and I asked him how his business was going. He was number one in China at the time. And he said, well, I'm, you know, I'm really pleased. We're going to be number four in five years. And I said, well, gosh, OK, why are you happy about that? That's a come down. And B, why are you being so precise? And he says, well, that's what Beijing has told us. And I just thought, whoa, OK, why is that not being covered? Why are we not thinking about what's happening in the market economy in the industrial commons, uh, in our competitiveness, competitiveness conversations through that lens? So I could keep going on and on, but I think that that realization is something that is still not making its way into coverage, and it's actually distorting how we think about these stories. I'll stop there. Thank you. Dina. Oh, you want to do me? OK. Uh, so my name is Dina Temple Raston. You may know me from NPR. So if you feel more comfortable closing your eyes when I speak, <laughs> I won't uh, take anything. Uh, that's fine. I now uh, am uh, the executive producer and uh, host of a podcast called Click Here. And it's a news podcast about cyber and intelligence. And we launched it just two weeks before the, um, the invasion of Ukraine. And so we were immediately immersed into these whole ideas of cyber in this conflict. In fact, we actually discussed going there uh, to cover the cyber conflict sort of up close. And then we were concerned that we would get there, the internet would come down, and then we couldn't file. We'd have all these great stories in you know, our tape recorders, but nothing that we could file. And of course, we know that's not exactly how things worked out there. And we can talk more about why that was. And, but what is happening out of Ukraine is I was talking to a DOD official um, just a couple of days ago in San Francisco. And, and they were saying that the Ukraine is giving uh, war fighters a brand new Petri dish to take a look at how things really work in cyber. Up to now, it's, a lot of it has been theoretical, right? Or at least there's this sort of low-grade aggression or aggressiveness. But there hasn't been sort of this fog of war or the tension of war until now. And what this uh, DOD official told me was that there are things that are being changed in the way the US looks at the cyber realm because of what we've learned from Ukraine. So that could be something that we discuss a little bit more uh, later. At Click here, we did uh, a whole series of uh, episodes on Ukraine. We had expected to do sort of more ransomware disinformation, but it seemed um, wrong for us to not be focused on Ukraine given what was going on in Europe. And one of the stories that we did was on the Ukrainian IT army. The Ukrainian IT army is essentially uh, the equivalent of CISA, a guy named Viktor uh, Zura in Ukraine. He's the equivalent of what Brian Krebs was at CISA. Says, um, look, professionals all over the world, we need help with our cyber fight. Come and help us. And so they volunteered. They got together on a Telegram channel. Ironically, Telegram is out of Russia, and uh, meaning it was invented by a Russian. And they get on these Telegram channels, and they start figuring out things that they can do to sort of push the cyber fight in Ukraine uh, and out towards Russia. And their number one priority, which I found really interesting, was misinformation and propaganda. It wasn't taking down a railway uh, switching system. It wasn't taking down a power grid. The number one thing that they were doing in terms of denial of service attacks, in terms of um, just targeting people with uh, particular pieces of information was this, this propaganda and uh, information piece. And in particular, what they were doing, and I'll give some specific examples a little bit later, in particular, what they were doing was targeting the Russian people to try to get them the real story. Mm -hmm. And um, I was expecting something else from them. Uh, there's also a group called the Elves. I don't know, like, uh, like Shoemaker and the Elves. There's a group called the Elves. And the Elves are in uh, Lithuania. 
Uh, and they're, now they're in 11 different countries in Europe, and they are doing the very same thing. They are working behind the scenes, as the little elves did with the shoes. You show up the next day and something is down or changed that has to do with misinformation. So this is all new. I've never seen anything like this, just uh, in, in, particularly in terms of it being a volunteer force. Now, the downside about this, of course, is that you spend all this time doing all these great hacks and you're burnishing your hacking skills in a way you never have before. And um, you know, the Department of Justice says they're very unlikely to use the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act against anybody who's fighting against Russia and on behalf of Ukraine. So what you're doing is you're almost setting up a cyber mercenary army, which we can talk about uh, later, too. Um, so that, that sort of, I hope, sort of sets the table for what it is that we're doing at Click Here in terms of misinformation and disinformation. And um, what we're seeing, sort of this grassroots campaign of people rising up to try and uh, right the wrong or, or at least try to provide truth to the right people. Thank you. Suzanne. Yes. Um, I'm a reporter at CyberScoop. We are a news website based in Washington focused solely on cybersecurity coverage. I have a unique lens on how disinformation has evolved and skepticism of the mainstream media in particular as somebody who spent the first 10 years of my career uh, from roughly 2000 to 2010 um, reporting at Newsweek and the Boston Globe. And at Newsweek, I covered two presidential campaigns. So I was in rural America very often talking to everyday voters. Um, and then I took some years off, about almost 10 years, having three children, and came back to news a few years ago working um, at Yahoo News on two podcasts that covered disinformation fairly extensively, and now um, at cybersecurity. And even in my, you know, I haven't had the equivalent experience of being on the ground in, you know, say, Iowa talking to voters, but just even in you know, coverage I've done in the past few years for Yahoo in particular, I've noticed an incredible difference in the way even sources, people I'm calling to get information from, really are much more uh, skeptical and don't trust me as a, as a journalist or a journalist in general. And so I, I think it's just been interesting to see how dramatically that's changed. Um, in that 10-year period, which is also sort of the period in which social media and some of the other um, phenomena that we've seen technology uh, fuel um, have kind of taken hold. Um, I'll follow up on what Dina said with um, an example from some of my recent reporting in uh, for CyberScoop covering disinformation in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And to take one example, um, in March, there was a deep fake video circulated um, which purportedly showed President Zelensky surrendering. And at the time, it was, it was very crudely done, and it was taken down quickly. And Google's threat analysis uh, executive, Shane Huntley, went on Twitter and said, this is an example of how people now easily recognize uh, deep fakes. And, um, you know, shows how they can be quickly taken down. And he was very much minimizing the episode. And so I interviewed several disinformation experts about that, and they basically slammed him, saying even, you know, this was an example of disinformation that was easy to quickly disprove because Zelensky handled it really well. He immediately shot a video, you know, disputing it, calling it a fake. Um, and circulated that. Uh, he also pre-bunked the fact that this video would be coming by saying, you know, Ukrainian intelligence expected to see something like this and to be on guard for it. And, and finally, because it was so crudely done, it was easy to discredit. But uh, the folks I talked to said even these, you know, less effective forms of disinformation, and in this case, deep fakes, are hugely damaging because of what they call the liar's dividend. And that is, it's not about the individual uh, piece of disinformation as much as it is the pollution of the entire information ecosystem and the doubt that this false information casts on everything else that is being circulated either on social media or among the mainstream traditional media. And you know, I think that is absolutely part of what now as a journalist I'm, I'm seeing with how much less trust there is uh, 
in the media. And I, I'd also say I think there is a real class issue in pl at play. Um, you know, there often you'll hear people kind of write you off as an elite or being with the institutions that you're covering. And it always makes me laugh because, in fact, the institutions I'm covering often find me to be a major pest. And um, I'm certainly not, you know, kind of collaborating with them. But um, that class division, I think, is partially fueled by something we talked about when we were preparing for the panel, which is that access to quality information is very much stratified by class. Um, Rana works for an outlet which charges um, several hundred dollars, I can't remember, maybe even a thousand dollars for a subscription. Um, the Atlantic and the Washington Post and the New York Times cost money to read. So many people in the population are only getting kind of straight news to the extent it's straight from CNN.com or Fox.com. And, and, you know, we're really segregated by what news we're receiving. And that, I think, contributes as well. Thank you. Um, all of you, in one way or another, have referred to larger systems. So, you know, an ecosystem of information, you were referring to markets. So let's back up a little bit and try to take the big picture view. And I know this is something you've thought about a lot, Rana. What big picture assumptions are in the world right now about how information should flow, what things uh, impact information flow? We have to, we're talking about disinformation. There's obviously a normative note there, right? That there's a way it should be flowing. So how do you, what, what's your theory of, of, of how the world works right now when it comes to information? <laughs> Well, you know, I'm going to pick up on what the point Suzanne made, which I think is very important. So um, the FT does charge for a basic subscription about $1,000. Our premiums go up to 5000 if you want all the bells and whistles. Our you know, median income of a, of a reader is about $400,000. So we're essentially, it's a, you know, about 1.2 million subscribers, the global elite. Now, those people got a very accurate story about what was going to happen in Ukraine before it happened. And I know because I was actually there in the fall moderating uh, and speaking at a, at a big conference in Ukraine. Um, I actually met President Zelensky. There was a huge debate at the time about what the Germans were going to do with, with Nord Stream 2. I mean, these, the way things were going to go down was, was quite well known. Um, and the concerns that were being raised were quite well, well known, but it was, it was being raised um, at a certain policy level amongst a certain group of people that may have been covered in the pages of the FT, but wasn't necessarily getting out there. And I know because, you know, I also am on contract at CNN, and one of the reasons they call me and pay me to be on air is because I actually know what I'm talking about because I'm paid more by another publication <laughs> to know what I'm talking about. And, but, but trying to get these very complicated messages out um, to say something like, well, um, the U.S. now has to decide between uh, defending Ukraine or uh, saying to Germany some hard truths about having sold out, uh, you know, various politicians selling themselves out on, on corporate boards to make the country uh, totally in dependent on Russian energy over the last 20 years as part of a neoliberal paradigm. I mean, like, I could go on, but you can't do that on CNN in three minutes, you know. Um, so, so that's part of it. Um, I also think that, um, you know, kind of going to the, some of the points that were made in my second book, uh, I don't agree with, with much that Rupert Murdoch says, but he was spot on that the media never, never should have given it away for free. I mean, we made a terrible mistake um, as the platform companies rose and as, as you know, from the mid-19 onwards, as dot-com uh, became the thing, just putting content online for free, letting it be monetized by others, and just totally disintermediating our own business model, which is, you know, why there's now this huge bifurcation between people who are willing to pay for really high quality, excellent information, where it's fact checked to within an inch of its life because we'll get sued for libel if it's not, and everything else that you find online. So um, I'm encouraged that I think there is now an understanding. Uh, in Washington, and you can see in some of the antitrust actions and some of the, um, you know, the privacy issues, J uh, Department of Justice suits, FTC stuff, what the European Union is, Union is doing to try and police disinformation a little bit better. But boy, it's, it's tough once the horse is out of the barn. Mm -hmm. 
Dina, Suzanne, any comments on the, that intersection between the, the business model for media and the political economy and information writ large? Um, well, I just wanted to build on something that, that Rana was talking about. So at the time, we were doing a lot of, before the invasion actually happened, we were doing a lot of reporting in Ukraine. And if two Ukrainian that we talked to, and they were in various strata, whether they were in government or whether they were um, business people or whether they were ordinary Ukrainians, they all thought the invasion wasn't going to happen. And, and, and we kept on saying, really, you think this is a head fake? And they kept on saying, yes, yes, we've been dealing with this for so long. So that's one, one data point. The other one is we had a, an episode on, um, we talked to Alexander Vindman. You may recall Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman was the one who was there for the phone call with Trump uh, when Trump said, do us a favor, though, to Zelensky. And I asked him in this episode to basically take me, because I haven't thought about Ukraine, I, I think I could say quite uh, candidly, for years. And then all of a sudden, in two years, I'm thinking about Ukraine as a central piece I need to think about when I never had to before. And I figured that, that there's no way that could be a coincidence. So I said to Vinman, can you take me from that phone call to war? How did we do that? And what he, just to distill it down, what he said that I thought was so interesting, and this had to do with um, believing people, right, is that um, the relationship broke between the US and Ukraine broke down so thoroughly after that phone call and after Trump and Zelensky he was just a new president, et cetera, et cetera, that when the US was intelligence was telling Ukraine, they're coming in. I know you think they're not, but they're coming in. Everything we have shows that they're coming in. The Ukrainians didn't believe us, that the relationship was so broken that that trust wasn't there. And this is not my opinion. This is you know, Vinman, who had been watching this for some time. And he said that's how we got from, from there to there. So it again gets to this idea of truth, right? That there was truth. There was uh, sort of all this um, data that was showing that this was happening. And, uh, and, they didn't, uh, and they didn't see it. They didn't believe it. Can I make one sure. just point? Because um, there's, we're talking about data uh, and information in terms of sort of tweets and media and interviews. But there's other kinds of data that you can be watching, like, for example, the stockpiling of gold in, in, um, in reserves, which Russia and China had been doing for several years in the run-up to this, because they knew that there would be weaponized sanctions. Um, so. There's a lot going on that the, the financial media is looking at, but they sometimes put it in a silo of prices are doing this or that. But let's look at the financial transactions through the lens of the political economy and through the lens of conflict. And I was looking at that and thinking, OK, here we go. You know, Someone's expecting there to be dollar-based sanctions, and they're preparing for a new era of the weaponization of the dollar. And that's where we are. So I would just add, and this is a bit of a, you know, veering back to something Rana said before about the need, you know, mistake that was made with not paying for journalism. And as a former um, reporter at a really strong regional paper that has since been in decline and struggling to be profitable. Um, the Boston Globe. Yes, the Boston Globe. Um, there is a real tragedy and threat um, around the fact that local news is basically decimated and you have effectively a handful of elite papers and outlets that are great. I mean, the New York Times and the LA Times and you know, the Washington Post are national treasures, but there really is no journalism covering local communities or regions uh, anymore. And um, you know, at The Globe, when I was there, one of my colleagues broke a story about a city councilor who was stealing huge amounts of money. I mean, you know, the, the accountability journals in the Globe broke the Catholic Church story. So it's just that is something that we'll have to figure out how to contend with because I think it will have a major effect on um, accountability for public officials. So thank you for bringing up, um, you know, the centrality of accountability and all the in journalism itself, but also in the roles you've been in. It would be really great to turn uh, this conversation into um, some consequences of disinformation that you've been able to cover. So we've talked about um, the reasons it exists in terms of the systems and the opportunities. We've talked less about what you've seen on the ground and how it works. Can you share some examples from your reporting about, you know, the consequences and the impact and, and the 
um, perhaps back to truth again, how, um, how that can affect communities. Let me talk about the IT army again. Um, and these are sort of cute examples, and I'm not saying that uh, misinformation is cute in any way, but uh, one of the really interesting things about the Ukrainian IT army is how creative they are. So how do you get information into Russia so that the people of Russia will understand that this isn't a special operation and that Vladimir Putin isn't winning? How do you get past the censors? How do you get people to actually read it? So there's actually a Google restaurant review uh, that goes into Russia, right? So that just like we use Yelp to see if we should bother going to this restaurant to eat. Uh, so you would look up a restaurant in the Google reviews, and instead of having a review of the restaurant, what would be there would be this many casualties in the Donbass today. Wow. This is what's going. I mean, pretty, uh, pretty smart, and and it got to a lot of people. Anonymous, which is not always on the side of the angels, but in this case was on the side of the angels, actually managed to get a bunch of Russian phone numbers, 200 million of them, and email addresses. So what they did is they actually set up a website so that anyone could go to that website and write a note to the Russians of these phone numbers and emails and everything else and say, this is what's really going on. This is what you should look for. These are, I mean, this is again gets to this idea of how do, how do you get ground truth? And one of the things that you mentioned that made me think of this too is you recall that there was going to be this movie that was going to come out of Russia in the run up to the invasion. And this movie that turns out to be a deep fake, or at least a fake, um, was going to show people in Ukrainian uh, uniforms uh, massacring a village of, of Russian speakers. And the US intelligence agencies had found out about this in advance and made the incredibly unusual decision to release it. What did you call it? Pre-bunk? Yeah. Pre-bunking. So they decided to pre-bunk it with lots of details. Now, of course, the journalists all came out and said, mm, we don't really believe you. We're not sure it's going to happen. And of course, the IC community said, well, of course, now it's not going to happen because we just told you about it. But it's, it's an interesting change in the way that the administration is trying to figure out how to battle misinformation. And to this point, and I've been doing a lot of national security reporting for about the last 25 years, and to this point, the, um, the intelligence community never wanted to put this out or would whisper it to you, and then you would sort of have trouble figuring out how to put it in a story without looking like you're a complete pawn. And now actually releasing it, and I think William Burns, the uh, the CIA director, who also has done his time in state and has been an ambassador, understood the importance of doing that beforehand. And it had an incredible effect. Um, I would just add that I think one of the difficulties with social media is um, really well represented with how Telegram has been used in this conflict. I mean, you have on one side um, the Russians using it to spread disinformation right and left. And just one example from that recently happened, they um, planted a story about Ukrainians selling weapons that the West had provided to them to African nations. And they you know, put together a photo of soldiers in Angola with a forged document that was supposedly showing the Ukraine Ministry of Defense um, you know, offering these weapons for sale. And the goal was, and there were, you know, they attached commentary, like, at, at a time when there aren't enough weapons for the Ukrainians on the ground, that the, you know, administration that Zelensky is, is selling these weapons for profit. And, um, you know, that was spread from one Telegram channel to several other pro-Russian Telegram channels in Ukraine, and then also to Telegram channels in Russia, um, and then, you know, RT. And so you can really just amplify one little campaign 50 times over and target different demographic subsets with, with these Telegram channels. But at the same time, you have the Ukrainians organizing on Telegram. And in fact, part of how that Zelensky deepfake video um, was pre-bunked was that um, you know, when intelligence officials figured it out, they, they had Ukrainian soldiers on popular Telegram channels pre-bunk it on their Telegram channels. So, you know, it, I think thinking about Facebook and Twitter, and they both can be a huge force of good and, and bad. And so figuring out how to regulate that and um, manage it is, 
I think, a major challenge that we have going forward. You know, I, I'm not as in the weeds of um, these kinds of stories around disinformation, but, but I try to follow the money and power, and I try to think a lot when I'm speaking to anyone about where's the money, where's the power, you know, what's in it for them. And I think that that's something journalists often, A, don't have the time to do, because particularly the younger reporters that are coming into the industry, you know, you're even at the FT, you suddenly, you're in the weeds and you're having five stories a day thrown at you and you don't really have time to go back and trace things deeply. I'll just give you, you know, a couple of examples. When I was doing my, my second book, I was looking very closely at some of the patent wars that were going on globally, which actually is becoming, that's gonna be another interesting arena and m much more important arena as the world fragments, as the global trading system falls apart. Countries, Germany, the US, China are looking to protect their intellectual property. They're developing different patent systems. Well, in the US, there have been kind of wars between big tech, which wants lower, interestingly, the big platforms want lower patent protection because they use so much of it, and biotech and pharma, which want tougher patent because they, it's one and done. You know, you need to be able to protect that one bit of IP. Well, so as I was researching, I, you know, you, you take academics as your sources sometimes, but you don't often think about where academics, who's paying the academics. So, you know, you start to look at the fine print on some of the amicus briefs and, you know, this or that person who's actually putting forward arguments that are going to the Supreme Court that are affecting how the protections of intellectual property get done are being paid by Google or Apple or Qualcomm or whoever, you know, so that kind of, um, I guess it's not disinformation, it's just looking deeply for the information and going back and back and back. And I guess I would trace that to my, my time. I, I was a cub reporter at Forbes magazine when I first started out. Um, and you, were, you reported half the time, but you fact-checked half the time. And the fact checking was, it was twofold. It was kind of a training process by which you would go back and reverse engineer the stories of your, of your older and more senior um, uh, colleagues. But it was also protection for the magazine because it was constantly being sued by very powerful rich people that you know, had the money to do that. And so if you had one mistake in a story as the fact checker, you were on probation. If you had two, you were out. So that kind of training, it's really hard to find these days. Well, let's, let's lean into that a little bit and talk about journalistic practices. In the current environment, you know, how, has, um, how have all these challenges affected how you work? We are, if you're covering modern conflict, there are already a lot of challenges, right? There's classified information, there's the need to um, protect people and protect sources in particular, but also communities. But talk about the challenges to doing the job right now. Um, well, obviously there's the fire hose of information, everything, I mean, I monitor Twitter religiously, get a lot of good story ideas from that, but often you'll end up going down a rabbit hole of something that turns out to be a bad idea because it's not true or, you know, it's spun in a way that, that makes it, you know, not worth covering. But I think there's also, I mean, I, I, you mentioned classified information. I mean, the importance, especially I cover Cyber Command and intelligence, it's very hard without sources leaking to get anything that's news in that realm. And um, recently, I, I, this is a good example of how kind of the lack of information, especially from agencies like the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Defense, can um, end up having major causing problems. Uh, so as most of you probably know, DHS recently rolled out the um, Disinformation Governance Board, which there's been a very big backlash to, and it, it was actually interesting because initially when it was announced at a congressional hearing, there was kind of just a shrug, nobody cared, and then Elon Musk tweeted about it, you know, this, this is a mess or something like that. And then it, it was off to the races, and especially on the right, everybody's attacking this. So a good example of how one tweet from somebody influential on Twitter can drive a story. Um, but I think also a great example of how when the government isn't giving out a lot of information or isn't clear about the information that they have, and in this case, both 
uh, things were true because as it turned out, this board will have no operational authority. So why is it called the governance board? Governance, you know, evokes uh, the Ministry of Truth in 1984. I mean, at least that's what people were saying to me. It sort of sounds dystopian. Um, when in fact, you know, Secretary of the DHS um, leadership was saying, this is gonna be a small working group. We've been doing disinformation monitoring. It's really just a new, you know, name and umbrella for what we've already been doing. So the communication around what this board would be was really poor. And as a journalist, writing about that is challenging because nobody's really saying what it will do. I don't wanna kind of promote the conspiracy theories that are rising up about this, this Entity, but at the same time, without good information, it's hard to counter disinformation. I think we've gotten really gun shy, actually. Um, I think a, a good example, though it's not a misinformation example, is the draft from the Supreme Court on uh, on Roe versus Wade. Uh, a lot of people stopped for a second and made sure that it was real, that uh, it wasn't somebody trying to do a head fake for us. I mean, I happen to know. Um, Josh Gerstein, who was one of the guys who did it, and I thought there's no way he would have gone with it unless it was absolutely positive, right? So the name actually meant a lot. Uh, and people were doing hand, uh, you know, uh, word choice analysis to see if it seemed like Alito. So um, in some ways, I feel like uh, the advantage to this kind of froth of misinformation is that it slowed everybody down. And uh, CNN got us, you know, CNN was really getting going when I was a White House correspondent during the Clinton administration. And it covered, you know, wall to wall, the Monica Lewinsky stuff and the Whitewater stuff. And um, I worked at CNN for a little while. And, and they said, we want to be first. And if it turns out it isn't quite right, um, we'll correct it on the next feed. Well, the same people aren't watching the next feed. Mm. So, uh, I mean, maybe they are. I mean, I watch CNN for large swaths of time, but still, who's going to, who's going to remember that? And um, so I think that what's happened is we've all sort of slowed down just a little bit and thought about the possibility of somebody, you know, of us being had. And I think it also, it gets to um, sources, too. And that, so I have a rule about sources, just to give you a, a glimpse into journalism. If you lie to me once, and it wasn't just like a maybe misunderstanding. If you bald face lie to me once, I never call you again, and I don't take your calls. It's only happened actually twice in my whole career. But your sources also are the ones who are going to make sure that you don't get had. And so when you're a younger reporter getting going, I think that that's a little bit more difficult because you don't have those. But by the time you know you get to be my age, I'm, you know I've known people for 20 years, and they've never steered me wrong. And there are also people who will say to me. Mm, I wouldn't go with that. I've heard it, but I'm feeling a little edgy about it, so you don't. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I spend almost no time on social media. I canceled Facebook, uh, which I only had for book promotion because I just think it's toxic. Um, I do Twitter, but I use it as a news feed mostly. You know, I push out my own things that I'm doing and my own content. I never get into anything on it. Um, same with LinkedIn. Uh, I basically call people, and it's funny. I mean, I guess it is. It's about being in the industry for a while. I remember when I was at Time Magazine running um, economics. I, I once had this hilarious experience. This is about ten years ago, uh, where I was walking through the the news floor, and I heard one of the younger reporters say, "You know, I think I'm going to do some old-fashioned reporting." And I was like, I stopped and I said, "What is old-fashioned reporting?" And she's like, "You know, calling people up." And I was like, oh my god, <laughs> i got to get out of management. <laughs> yeah, I would just add to that, because I, I was a cops reporter at the Boston Globe, and I actually had a major mistake on a story where somebody lied to me. Um, it was a political, you know, internal war between different factions in the police department. And, um, you know, it was the worst experience of my life. Uh, my editor is Marty Barron, who is, you know, the guy who broke the Catholic news story, and he does not tolerate errors, and I was publicly humiliated. Who played him in the movie? Pardon? Liv Schreiber. Yeah, Liv Schreiber, played him yeah. In the movie. yeah. Spotlight. Yeah, so um, I think that, you know, you always have to have two sources for anything to go into print, and they have to, you have to really trust them. And it, I thought I wanted to be a reporter because I loved writing, and actually the reporting and the source building is by far 
the most um, challenging but important part of it. And I would just say to the various military and federal agents watching this that I think sometimes have a knee-jerk um, sort of distaste for the idea of sources that, in fact, you can talk to a reporter and hold a lot of things back but still give them ideas or broad sort of hints about things that are important that are at the cutting edge that it's just impossible to understand when you're on the other side without sources. And everything we read in, in the media, most of it, most of the good work that's out there is coming from sources. And so, you know, just an appeal to think about it. <laughs> Your uh, comments in that last question make me want to press a little bit on this contradiction. You know, you talked about old-fashioned or going slow and the importance of getting it right, right? Uh, norms of, that are always important to journalism and contrasting that with the speed we know with, with which disinformation travels. To me, that raises questions about evidence. Mm -hmm. What counts as evidence for different people? How we think about that when we're telling a story or when we're making an argument, right? So do you want to talk a little bit about your experience for, you know, you have to find what's right but different communities have different standards for what counts as meaningful evidence. And it seems to me that there's a huge change in what people accept as truth or fact or even just the warrant for a claim. So when I was at NPR, we did a lot of work on the January 6th um, riots. In particular, we put together a big database that had every single person who was charged, what the charge was, and then with a, uh, with a bio of that person. And if you, it's still up, uh, we keep adding to it and where the cases have gone and that sort of thing. And uh, I also teach at Temple Law School. I teach a media class and a cyber regulation class with my husband at Temple Law School. And um, I, I think ki uh, kids, I think students today just have a different idea of what it means to be a journalist. And they were stunned in our First Amendment class that I actually check things, that I have an editor who mm. says, OK, who is, you know, who are your two? So I was talking with a colleague about this today. You know, um, who are you have an unnamed source because you don't want to burn them and have them lose their job, which was a bigger problem during the Trump administration than it is in the current administration. Um, and, and I came from the tradition that you told your editor in confidence, it's this person and this person. This is training from Bloomberg. I was one of the original Bloombergers. It's this person and this person. And um, this is why they're in a position to know. So we were talking about January 6th. And January 6th is really interesting. So I was interviewing a lot of people who were arrested uh, in January 6th, and um, like maybe dozens. And what was really interesting about it is that they were a different cohort than I expected, right? They were mostly in their 40s and 50s, the ones who actually breached the Capitol. And uh, so that's around about my age. And that means they missed Nixon, but came up you know, through uh, all the different presidents that we had. And they were brought up to think more or less that when the president says something, it's true. It might be shaded, we know it's shaded, but they more or less thought if the president says it's true. And the fact that President Donald Trump said the election was stolen meant to them that it was true because he was saying it as the president and the president tells the truth. Again, they, they missed Nixon, right? So. Um, Nixon might have cast a, a, a seed or two of doubt. But I, through the other presidents that we've gone along, I mean, Bill Clinton, I was in the White House at that time as a reporter. He lied about a personal relationship. I think people see that a little bit differently. But this was lying on a, a whole scale level. And so when I talked to these people, they said the president said it. And he said it was stolen. And he's talked about these Dominion machines. And I've done some research online. And also, there's this idea that online is gospel, which is quite amazing. So if you put together their thought process, these were not people who were not intelligent. These were people who had specific facts and put them together in what they thought was a very logical way and came to a completely different conclusion than somebody, say, like me or the rest of us here, who actually ask more questions than they probably have time for. I, I would pick up on that and say, I think that at the heart of some of these things, it goes back to this point that I started with, which is that I think we are at a 70-year pivot point in just what the world is going to look like, the kind of political philosophy underpinning it. And that is, that is raising, even at the most, you know, the kind of grand publications, these interesting um, d disagreements about what, what is opinion, what is fact. I mean, I'm kind of floored, for example, by the amount of 
what I think of as opinion that is now running on the front page of the New York Times, um, or the Wall Street Journal for that matter. Um, I, I think that um, even at my own publication, for example, I've been one of the few, so the, the, the FT has a kind of a you know, very free market, but we think markets should be reined in by government regulation. It's kind of a European, more European-centric view, but very kind of Ricardian. We believe in free trade. We believe it, you know, all trade is good. It can only make all boats rise. And I will say, well, I think that we need to question some of those, those um, stances. I mean, I would agree with you know, some of the things Catherine Tai is saying right now about this. But those things, I mean, even amongst the highest level journalists at the, mo at the most expensive and supposedly reputable publications, there are these really fundamental arguments going on about what is truth. And I think that reflects the fact that we are moving out of this sort of neoliberal age into we don't know quite what yet. There's not another unified field theory yet. But that, and that's why so much is in flux. And then you layer into that the technology that, you know, the social media that makes, um, you know, uh, all of this stuff just puts it on steroids. And it's a lot. It's a lot to cope with. I would just add, at my last or job before this job, um, I worked on a podcast called Conspiracy Theory that our former Newsweek colleague, Mike Isakoff, um, produces. And it, the uh, iteration in question was about Lori Catchless, who was... Um, worked in Joe Scarborough's office when he was a congressman, and she died of natural ca causes. But there's been this conspiracy theory that she was murdered by Scarborough because they were having an affair. And um, the for the work I was doing on this podcast, I had to go into QAnon and find there were all kinds of crazy things on QAnon about you know, the JFK assassination and like just really out of left field associations for why Joe Scarborough did this. And um, I don't know what to say about it and I don't know what the solution is, but the fact that so many people are able to go there. Um, did you find he didn't do it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we talked to all kinds of people, including the medical examiner. He definitely didn't do it. Okay. But um, <laughs> there is a huge, population of people that still believe he did, and um, QAnon has certainly helped foster that, and that phenomenon may be dying a little bit, but just that so many people were ready to believe that, or ready to believe that the election is stolen. I, I don't quite know how you, you um, can find truth in a society where that's possible, um, or find a common truth, and, and so I wonder if my co-panelists have a thought, but it, it's alarming. You know what's really different is the megaphone aspect of this, because when I was a White House correspondent, you know, um, uh, Foster, mm -hmm. uh, Dan Foster? Vince Foster. Foster. Vince Foster, yeah. thank you, sorry. So Vince Foster, right, yeah. was found in Rock Creek Park, and of course it was because he was having an affair with, this sounds very similar, right. he was having an affair with Hillary, and then allegedly. it was a problem. Yeah, allegedly, sorry, <laughs> sorry, allegedly having an affair with Gary. <laughs> okay. So allegedly having an affair with Hillary, and that was a real problem, and, and that someone in Clinton's sphere had actually um, taken him out. And there's an absolutely amazing, one of my favorite New Yorker articles ever was written by Elsa Walsh. It was called After Vince. And it was one of the first articles that really took a look at depression in a sort of wide audience kind of way and sort of pieced together what happened. But you know, no one would have read The New Yorker, right, if there had been a Scarborough piece. They would have, they, the, uh, the megaphone just gets it out to the nooks and crannies that they need to get to. And, you know, we used to talk about this in terrorism when I was at National Security, did counterterrorism for NPR. And it used to be that when you radicalize someone, you needed a one-on-one. -on -one. So Al-Qaeda would send, so I, I wrote a book about the Lackawanna Six, and uh, Al-Qaeda actually had a guy on the ground in Lackawanna who um, befriended these guys, convinced them to go to uh, uh, Osama bin Laden's camp, this is before, 2001, this is just after the USS Cole, and what you needed was that one-on-one -on -one sort of gang mentality to convince somebody to go. And fast forward to Al-Shabaab, the Somali uh, sort of uh, arm of Al-Qaeda, they had rap videos. Fast forward to ISIS, they had GoPro cameras. So it, it becomes more and more diffuse where it becomes more theater and less mm. the one-on-one. -on -one. And I think that that's what we're seeing happen, and that's what needs to be shaken out. 
I see the question asking people are ready. If there are any questions in the audience, I'll have one more. But if you have one, um, please uh, raise your hand, perhaps, and the, the uh, mic can come to you. Um, you know, we're, it's, since we're in when the conflict, uh, excuse me, context of this meeting, talking about modern conflict, we've always known that it was not safe and it was a risk that journalists accept when they're going out in the field, right, in war. Th talk about what it's like to be a journalist today. What does safety mean to you today? And this, and we, you know, we heard about um, the uh, suspect refrigerators and microwave ovens that might be getting into our, <laughs> all of our homes. But let's talk about what it's like to be you. Your job is to get the truth out, and there's some risk in that. So, do you want to share anything about what that feels like or your experience? Sure. Um, I, I recently, I mean, I don't feel afraid for my life, really, because I I'm, don't report overseas and, you know, for the most part, feel safe in that regard. But I actually worry a lot about sources. I recently broke a story about um, something called NSPM 13, which is a presidential national security memorandum that the Trump administration um, gave to defense to... Um, basically expand cyber authority so they didn't need to go to the White House um, for approval. And um, the White House was very displeased that this had leaked and, I mean, really remained very displeased. And there was definitely a witch hunt on for who told me. And I, that, that part of the work and just, like, protecting my phone, only doing things in signal, um, you know, not even telling my husband who I'm talking to, it, it's... I, you know, you just kind of, and we all lived through Matt Cooper and others being threatened with going to jail um, over not revealing their sources. It, it's something that I really um, fret about a lot and, and take great care to, to um, protect them because in my mind, that's something people should know, that there is this debate going on about how much authority defense should have for cyber ops. But in fact, it's classified and so, Defense and everybody, you know, the establishment doesn't want that conversation out. Yeah, I, um, so I've done a lot of war correspondency, so it kind of changes your idea of what's dangerous. Um, uh, because you have to be sort of in the exact wrong place at the exact wrong time. And I think that works here, too. I feel like the pressure has let off on us a bit since the Trump administration has ended. Um, I, I think that there's still a huge swath of the country that don't trust us. But because that steady drumbeat of uh, lamestream media has sort of gone away, uh, I feel like it's faded more. Um, but I will tell you that trying to talk to uh, people who, January 6th people, I told my husband where I was going. And, um, you know, I had a ping on my phone, so if I went missing, for a bunch of three percenters or Oath Keepers. Um, I, was, I was worried enough about the, um, the instability that might be underneath uh, that I was careful about that. But I think it was, it was a lot worse before during the Trump administration because you'd be at an event and you'd be in the back and then he would name you and then everybody would turn around and look at you and you knew <laughs> what the mob mentality could be. And I feel like that's gone down a lot. Um, the, and yeah. the fact that uh, President Biden actually showed up at the White House Correspondents' Dinner last week, um, the what will be called the super spreader event, I'm sure. <laughs> um, uh, the fact that he showed up was actually, uh, he was right. It was meaningful because we do have a really important role. But I think there's a, there's a long road to getting back to where we were because I think that uh, a lot of, we were diminished for a long time. So I've not done war correspondency, you know, in the field, but I have taken on a lot of powerful people in my career and um, have frequently been, ha you know, threatened, had them call my boss and demand my head, you know, that kind of thing, a former Treasury Secretary, former British Chancellor, a couple billionaires, and, you know, you just really hope you have your facts right, <laughs> and if you do, you're usually okay. But I, it is interesting to me, in, in, with my tech reporting in particular, um, when I came to the FT, I, you know, again, just look where the money and the power is, and I started running the numbers, and I'm like, wow, there's been this huge transfer of wealth between the financial sector and the tech sector since the financial crisis, and so let me start digging into this and see, you know, what's going on here. And by that time, the tech industry itself had become so embedded in funding a lot of the big publications. I mean, the Times, the FT, the... 
uh, Washington Post, I mean, owned by Jeff Bezos, but you know, all get money from these innovation funds, um, hundreds of millions of dollars in some cases, that are put, uh, put out there by the companies that we're trying to cover. So does that have an influence? Yeah, I think it probably does. The famous line from Watergate, follow the money. Exactly. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. I think a microphone is coming to you. And just a gentle reminder to introduce yourself, please. Uh, my name is John Kornblum. <clears throat> I'm a retired diplomat, but I'm also a national resident. So I w w wanted to ask for a bit of a historic context. Isn't it true that up, I don't know when, beginning of the 20th century, newspapers were essentially owned by people who only reported what they wanted to have in them. Haven't we all over the past, say, 100 or so years been living in an exception rather than the rule? Uh, because you can just think of historical events which were started by the Yellow Press, the Spanish-American War, the Mexican War, all kinds of things. Newspapers had gave no pretense of being objective for a very long time. I, I totally agree with that. It's funny, I have a friend, Anya Schifrin, who's a professor at SIPA and at Columbia who has done a whole paper on that very topic, kind of looking at 19th century you know, journalism and what it looks like now, how similar it is to now. And I agree, I think that, a, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, and I mean, you could say that the last 40 years maybe, um, you know, has been an exception in so many ways, right? and that we're now going back to normal, and we're now going, we're in another Gilded Age, and you know, I think a lot about this because I find it fascinating what's going on in the, something I'm covering quite a lot is the Biden administration's shift around antitrust and monopoly, and thinking about power, how do we think about power? You know, I think those questions are, need to be very much front and center again. Well, I, I just say, I, Jeff Bezos owning the Washington Post, and the Washington Post continuing to do very aggressive coverage of Amazon. I think, you know, I don't know Bezos, but I sort of wonder if it weren't the norm in our country that if you're an owner, you need to be hands off. Would he be this hands off? He doesn't seem like the kind of guy that would welcome necessarily really aggressive reporting on his company. Uh, but it's just not something you do. And um, I think just, I mean, this is sort of a simplistic observation, but we should all be grateful for that. Um, the New York Times, in, in the same way, you know, has, when Jason Blair happened, very aggressive coverage of the mistakes, the editor, um, Hal Raines. So, it, you know, it's good to see um, that division between ownership and, and the journalism remaining high integrity. And Caliphate as well, their podcast. They really took that to task because yeah. they were... They were misled. Well, that puts us exactly at time, actually. So we'll invite you to continue the conversations in the hallways and amongst yourselves. Please join me in thanking our panelists for this wonderful discussion. <laughs>